Okay. Good morning, good afternoon uh, to everybody. Uh, and welcome to the second day of uh, this uh, science workshop on natural rubber systems and, and climate change. I'm pleased to open it on behalf of the co-organizer, IRG, IRDB, CIRAD, C4, and the CGI research program on forest trees and agroforestry. Uh, we, we still have a, a, an exciting program today. Uh, yesterday, on the first day, we, we, we looked at uh, broadly the impact and the challenges that uh, climate change poses to, to rubber production in different areas. Uh, we, will, we will close uh, this segment of, of the workshop today, uh, this morning or early afternoon, uh, by looking at the impact in, in traditional and, and non-traditional areas. We, we, we see that both are disrupted in, in different ways. Uh, and then in, uh, in, in, the, in the second part of, of this day, we looked at we look at the responses, uh, the responses that rubber uh, can bring to these challenges, both when we look at the mitigation uh, opportunity, but also uh, the adaptation. And then uh, on, on day three, uh, tomorrow we'll see uh, how we can uh, facilitate these responses, uh, either by acting on, on policies or the enabling environment at national or international level. So, uh, without further ado, let's start uh, the session. 1.3. Uh, uh, you have the program on the web if you want to follow and we're delighted to have uh, four distinguished presenters. Uh, Dr. Mokafe from Nigeria, Fredegier from France, uh, Dr. Otman from Malaysia and Dr. Vijaya from Indonesia. Uh, I think we may start with the presenter number two, uh, Fredegier, because uh, we're just trying to get Omokafe, uh, Dr. Mokafe online. So uh, we'll have 15 minutes for each presentation, uh, and then we'll have a question and answers. If you have questions during the presentations or remarks, or for, this is to all the participants, please look at the chat. Uh, there is a chat function, so you can make comments. And there is also, if you have very specific questions, a Q&A um, feature, you can also use that to ask questions to uh, the presenters. So, Frédéric, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm sharing my screen now. Okay. Can everything, can everyone see it? Okay. Let's go. Okay, so um, good morning, everybody. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank RSG and all the organizers of the workshop for inviting me to give this, um, this presentation uh, that deals with the management of soil quality to improve the sustainability of uh, rubber plantations. So I'm uh, Dr. Frédéric from CIRAD, and I'm doing this presentation on behalf of a group of researchers from France, Thailand, and Ivory Coast who are or, or were involved in the works I uh, will um, present in this, uh, in, in this slide. So uh, first, to start this presentation, I would like to, uh, to recall the importance of uh, soils in the mitigation and adaptation uh, to climate change. So uh, this, uh, in this figure issued by FAO in uh, 2015 for the International Year of Soil, uh, we can see the multiple uh, ecosystems, functions, and services uh, the soil provides. Among them, two uh, in, in red here are important for the mitigation of climate change. Uh, these are the capacity of soil to uh, store uh, organic carbon and also the role of soil in the regulation of uh, greenhouse gas emissions, particularly uh, emissions of nitrous, nitrous oxide uh, that is linked to the application of mineral fertilizers. Uh, regarding adaptations, uh, adaptation soils are, impo are, are important because they are essential for the primary productivity of the ecosystem uh, through the regulation of uh, nutrient and water cycle uh, that depend a lot on the biodiversity of organisms living at the soil surface, surface or in the soil layers. Okay. Uh, if one go uh, through the recent scientific literature about rubber plantations and soils, 
uh, you will mainly uh, find papers about the negative effects uh, of uh, the conversion of land use uh, from forest to plantations. For instance, in this paper uh, of de Blecourt and, and et al., uh, it, 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 is, uh, it showed uh, the, the strong decrease in soil organic carbon after the conversion of uh, secondary forest to rubber plantation in South China. And these other papers from, uh, from Guillaume et al. Uh, show a broader view of the soil degradation after forest in, uh, in Indonesia. Deforestation is, of course, uh, an important issue, but uh, today my objective is to consider the role of soils in the sustainability of rubber plantations. That means what happened after the deforestation. Okay, several questions must be addressed. First, uh, if conversion of forest to rubber drives soil degradation, we can wonder what happened when uh, we change uh, land use from another crop to, to rubber. So this is the first question we can, we can ask. Uh, secondly, uh, it is also uh, important to look at how soil quality evolves uh, during the lifetime of a rubber plantation that spans from 20 to 40 years. Uh, for instance, in the case of conversion of forest to rubber plantation, uh, does soil degradation continue or is there any room for improvement of soil, or soil functions? Obviously, uh, it is necessary also to wonder how sensitive are the performances of the rubber plantation, in particular, particularly yield, uh, to soil quality. And finally, as agronomists, uh, we must, uh, we are interested to know if there are good agricultural practices that can help to improve soil quality or at least uh, avoid to uh, more degradation. So in the following, I will try to bring some kind of an answer uh, to these questions based on the works we have done uh, over the last years. Okay, uh, then at this point of my presentation, it is uh, important to make things clear about uh, how we define and assess uh, soil quality. Actually, we rely on the definition brought forward by uh, Carlen et al. and Walter et al. that uh, soil quality is the capacity of soils to function and provide ecosystem uh, services. Concretely, it means that uh, we cannot assess soil quality only through the measurement of nutrient stocks or basic physical parameters such, a, such as soil texture. We need indicators of the main functions of soil. In this respect, uh, we developed the biofoam tool uh, method based on uh, a, a conceptual approach of Kibble White that, that identifies three main soil functions, carbon transformation, nutrient cycling, and structure maintenance. For each of these functions, uh, we selected low-cost in-field indicators uh, with the idea of building an affordable and user-friendly tool for assessing soil quality. Uh, the current version of the biofilm tool method uh, includes nine indicators, uh, which are uh, finally aggregated in one soil quality index. So uh, in, the, in, in the following, we will see uh, several examples of the application of this tool. Okay, back to the rubber plantation now. Uh, when uh, considering the relationship, relationships between soil and, function, and the functioning of the plantation, okay, we must distinguish two main phases of a rubber plantation. The immature phase uh, from the first years, from the planting of the, plant, of the plantation and until uh, the opening of the trees for latex harvesting that occurs between five to seven, year, uh, seven years after, uh, after planting, and the mature plantation, um, which follows and can last up to 30 years and correspond to the period of tree tapping for latex. Uh, in two recent papers, we have highlighted the specificities of these two phases uh, regarding fertilization and nutrition of the trees. Okay, the immature phase is uh, characterized by a rapid growth of the tree, high nutrient requirement, and positive, uh, significant positive response to fertilization or soil fertility. 
uh, and during the mature phase, uh, we have a low uh, growth and uh, nutrient export and a response to yield, a response of yield to fertilization that is unclear. In this slide, in the, in the graph and the table, uh, we uh, have illustration of, of those features. In the graph, uh, so the graph displays the nutrient accumulation uh, throughout the lifespan of a rubber plantation, so nutrient accumulation in the tree. Uh, data come from rubber plantations in Ivory Coast. It shows a, a peak of nutrient accumulation between two and five years uh, old uh, and a decrease afterwards. So it showed the importance of uh, the immature phase in nutrient accumulation in the system. Uh, in the table, uh, so the table presents the results of a five-year uh, experiment on the effect of mineral fertilization on the rubber yield and functioning of a mature plantation. So the first line uh, confirms uh, that fertilization uh, doesn't have a strong uh, direct effect on the rubber yield. Uh, you can see here that after five years, the uh, effect of fertilization, fertilization is uh, the same, is similar, and relatively small, whatever the dose is. But on the other end, uh, the results also show that several variables uh, related to tree functioning or latex metabolism increased proportionally to the dose of fertilizer. So then these results suggest that proper management of the fertilization or of the soil fertility can be favorable for the plantation sustain sustainability. From our work in Thailand, we also highlighted the changes in soil quality along the lifetime of a rubber plantation. Uh, in this graph shows the Biofunk Tool Soil Quality Index for a chrono sequence of rubber plantations compared to the main previous land use of the study, which was cassava field and a local forest. Here again, we can distinguish the immature phase and the mature phase. So the immature phase, uh, which uh, displays a low soil quality that is not uh, different from the previous land use. And uh, along the mature phase, an improvement of soil co quality uh, towards the, the quality of the forest. So then, in the previous slides, uh, we got some answers to the question about how soil quality evolves in, in a rubber plantation and how it can affect plantation performances or sustainability. Uh, with this in mind, we will now look at the three, at three examples to illustrate, illustrate what can be good agricultural practices. So the two first examples uh, we will see are related to the management of soil cover, and the third one uh, is related with the management of the replanting phase between two successive plantations. Okay, the first example to uh, illustrate uh, the importance of soil cover management comes from uh, a study carried out in Northern Thailand in the framework of uh, the EVA ADAPT project. Uh, in this uh, study, runoff and soil detachment were compared between maize, field, mature rubber plantation, immature rubber plantation with intercrops, uh, and mature rubber plantation in which herbicides were used to eliminate the natural vegetations in the row or in the interrow. Okay, the results clearly show that the risk of soil erosion increases when the soil is bare and even in mature plantation with a dense tree canopy. So then this uh, results confirms the importance of inter intercropping during the immature phase and uh, the importance of limiting chemical weeding uh, during the immature or mature phase uh, that was already uh, shown by uh, the works of the German and Chinese team in, this, in South China. In South China. The next, um, the second example about soil cover management uh, illustrates the benefits of cover cropping with legumes. First, uh, a study carried out in the marginal rubber uh, growing area of the northeastern Thailand showed the strong influence of growing uh, puraria intercrops, cover crops, on the growth of the trees. In this study, uh, the nitrogen fixation by the leguminous crop was estimated to more than 200 kilos of nitrogen per hectare. In the second study, in the same region, we looked at the effect of uh, a mukuna cover crop on the soil quality assessed with, with, with the biofilm tool method. Uh, the results show that uh, the soil quality of a four-year plantation with mukuna 
was significantly higher than a four-year plantation with cassava intercropping and was similar to the soil quality in a nine-year-old plantation. So with this, we can accelerate the, uh, the improvement of soil quality. Okay, the next example is to illustrate the problem of replanting management. Uh, from this study in, in, in South Thailand, uh, in this study we, uh, in South Thailand, we mimic the, the, the uh, sequence, uh, 75 year sequence, uh, starting with forest and uh, continuing with three successive uh, rubber plantation. And we can see that uh, along this sequence, we have a, a continuous decrease of uh, soil, of organic matter content despite the, the little improvement that can occur during the, 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 the rubber plantation. The problem is that in the most, in most rubber producing countries, part of part or the wall of the tree biomass of the, of the old plantation, the previous plantation is exported uh, or burnt, before setting up a new one. So in some countries, trunks and bigger branches of, uh, of rubber are used as timber, so, so then they represent an alternative source of revenue for farmers. But in other countries, residues are just burnt, which is not acceptable. So then we set up an experiment in Ivory Coast to test another option, uh, which consists in leaving part of the entire tree biomass in the intervals uh, of the, the new plantation. And uh, the results show that, so uh, here again is the results with the biofilm tool, uh, the biofilm tool method. Uh, it shows first that uh, after only 18 months uh, of the, after logging of the plantation, and so the, the 18 months with the residue on the, on the, on the ground, uh, we can see a significant increase in uh, soil quality, in the soil quality index, in the, and in, at the same time, we can see a positive effect on tree growth. Then we can uh, summarize the information uh, from this presentation as follows. First, we saw that soil quality can have a strong positive effect on the functioning of the rubber plantation. Therefore, managing soil quality must be taken into account in strategy for the adaptation of rubber plantations to climate change. In this respect, it is important to keep in mind that soil quality naturally improves in mature plantations. But in the meantime, good agricultural practices can be adopted to avoid soil degradation or further improve the quality of the soil. Uh, in my presentation, I didn't really talk about it, but it is important to revise fertilizers application in accordance with better knowledge of nutrient dynamics. And in the meantime, soil cover and logging residues management uh, must be considered uh, because they are examples of the importance of adding organic matter or life or death to the soil. Last point, this last, uh, the, see, my, my last point, besides experimental works to enrich our knowledge to the re, uh, about the re relationships between practices, soil quality and plantation performances, it is, is also important to work on the factors that can contribute to the adoption of these practices by small orders. Because uh, as um, some papers uh, have pointed out, uh, this is uh, certainly the main bottleneck to the uh, adoption of, the, of these practices that I show. Uh, and this point must be addressed in the future. Then uh, to conclude, I would like to acknowledge uh, the funding agency and private companies which funded the different projects that allow us to produce uh, the data I, I presented to you uh, today. So there was, uh, the Thai International Cooperation Agency, the French National Research Agency, Yara Company, and the French and the, the, the company that makes the French Rubber Institute. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, uh, Frédéric. I, I propose that we, we go to the uh, presentation of, of Dr. Otman from, from Malaysia and just a message in the meantime to Dr. Mokafe from Nigeria if he's hearing me uh, please please get in touch with us uh, and, and give us a sign so that we're sure you, you're going to be able to present. So Dr. Otman the, the floor is yours. Uh, can you hear me? 
Yes, we can. Yeah, okay. Thank yes, you. Dr. Aziz, yes. I, no, I call uh, the director of Arara in Nigeria, so they are making arrangements to get Mukafi ready. Excellent. Thank you so much. Please, uh, please, please go ahead. Uh, yeah. Okay. Good afternoon. Hello. Good afternoon. Good morning. Okay. Slide that. Afternoon. Uh, can you hear me? Please. Hello. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Well. Okay. All right. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, also good morning. And good morning. Right? Good morning. Good morning. Okay. okay. I'm Ramli Usman. Is a fellow of the RDB, a retired plant breeder from the Rubber Research Institute of the Malaysian Rubber Board. All right, next. So the natural rubber uh, belongs to the family Euphobiaceae, and there are 10 species in this genus Hevia. Right? And, and this genus Hevia the, right, is in the Amazon basin. Also, you can find it in Bolivia, Colombia, Peru, Ecuador, French Guiana, Guiana, Suriname and Venezuela. So different species prefer different habitat, whereas Hevia presidencies you can find all over in this region of center of origin. And when you look at the environment in the Amazon, all right, it is a flat land between the equator. Equator is over here and goes down to uh, 15 degrees South. So these are the region of the center of origin, and normally the altitudes, altitudes not exceeding 200 meters, and it's a wet equatorial climate, 25 to 28 degrees centigrade, with abundant rainfall more than 2,000 millimeters per year. And the commercially out of the 10, one species, Hevia brasilensis, is commercially cultivated. Right. And they has been planted mainly in mineral areas. These are having uh, this latitude of uh, let, uh, latitude of the 10 degrees north and uh, south of the this equator. All right. These are the main rubber areas, we call it, which having more or less the same environment as in the center of diversity. All right? And these areas having rainfall of 2,000 to 4,000 millimeters and mean temperature to the degrees, plus minus two degrees centigrade, and also the daytime, 12 hours, regardless of the season. Right. Dr. Otman, okay. yes, uh, yes. sorry to interrupt you, is Vincent here. If you, uh, some in the chat have asked if you could put the slides full screen because the uh, full screen. Okay, 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 all right. If, thank you very much. Sorry for interrupting. Okay, and and then this rubber has been moving up to the away from the traditional. We call it the non-traditional areas. And we lost. Yeah, we don't. All right. And this yeah. is, is the latitude for the non traditional areas is that those areas more than 10 degrees north or south of the equator. And these areas having suboptimal environments and they have constraints uh, with the droughts, low temperature, high altitude, disease, and strong winds. Okay. 
and it just well we're trying to make it big screen okay this the non traditional areas Okay. Uh, we're talking about this 18 degrees to the 24 degrees north. Example, those in India of northeast, Vietnam Highlands and the coastal, and South China, Thailand northeast, all right, and Bangladesh. And whereas in the south, these treasure areas, 20 to 22 degrees south, uh, this this Brazil southern plateau, Sao Paulo, all right, and it seems. All right, rubber is a robust and versatile plant. And in those in marginal areas, what we have to do is planting the right clone at the right environment. So the breeders have been uh, having very good success. Uh, all right, in the early days of the unselected seedlings, the yield was about 400 kg per hectare per year. And uh, we managed to increase the yield the genetic potentials beyond 3,000 kg per hectare per year, right? With the, the new modern clones. And, and to the breeders, uh, because the heavier breeding is actually an art as well as a science, all right? So the breeders always uh, want to breed ideal clone, the clone that is a big, strong, and friendly, and of course, satisfaction guaranteed, all right? And we have to go initially to the drawing board. We have to draw and what we like to have. So the tree must be uh, vigorous and a fast growing and, and high latex yield, all right? And a high timber volume. And we want the trees to be, the trunk should be erect, all right? With acute angle branches, and uh, disease resistance, all right, and uh, wind resistance, and also having very good taproot system for the good anchorage and for the uh, uptake of the nutrients and water, and also thick bark, all right, to give you to have more of the latex vessels, and of course, uh, of this robust tree, vigorous tree, we can have a very good timber volume at the end of the day. So to summarize the breed objectives is uh, then we put on paper high latex yield, high timber yield, good growth vigor, resistance to major leaf diseases, resistance to wind damage, good growth increment on tapping, good bark thickness, tolerance to tree dryness, acceptable latex and rubber properties, response to chemical stimulation, and good cedar, this is optional. Uh, those interested for the oil, all right? And then uh, those in marginal areas, then we, they prefer to have this additional cold tolerance clone. Dr. Hoffman, well, yes. sorry to interrupt once again. We, we are stuck at, at your slide number seven. So we, we are, uh, if, if you could um, please uh, go to the, we, we are not seeing the, the current slides. It is, it is stuck. Number seven, hold on. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six. So if, if, you, could, if you could go seven. to the right slide and continue your talk, it was very interesting, but just, just put the good slides three. so that we could- Non-traditional, non-traditional seven. Yeah, I'm, I'm, we are trying two, two four, six, seven. Non-traditional like if you want, we could also pass the slides for you from, from the back end, if you prefer. Uh, uh, I've already changed some of the slides. We'll use our slides, right? Okay, here. All right, the, the non-traditional areas, the rubber has been planted. I'm moving to the non-traditional areas. These are having those planted in the latitude uh, greater than 10 degrees north and south of the equator, all right? And example of those countries, those beyond within this 18 degrees to 20 degrees south, 
uh, India Northeast, right? Vietnam Highlands and Coastal, South China, Thailand Northeast, Bangladesh, and those in the south, 20 to 22 degrees south, is the Brazil Southern Plateau, Sao Paulo. And to us, to the breeders, all right, rubber is robust and versatile. Even in those marginal areas, uh, what we have to do is the planting the right clone at the right environment. All right. And the breeders having uh, very good success in breeding these rubber clones. And for those unselected seedlings, initially we get about 400 kg per hectare per year. But we managed to increase through the breeding program and up to beyond 3,000, having genetic potentials of beyond 3,000 kg per hectare per year. All right. And the uh, QS breeding, PBR breeding is an art, also a science. And breeders always want to breed ideal clone. That means a clone which is a strong, big, strong, and friendly. And, and of course, satisfaction guaranteed. So we always go to the drawing board, like here, and we draw. And what to expect? We expect uh, uh, clones which is uh, vigorous and fast growing, all right? Having erect trunk and high timber volume for, and then high latex yield. Disease resistance, even to the coming one, pestalotiopsis and so on. And wind resistance, all right? all this trunk damage our, and have very good taproot system, right? This is for the drought mainly. It can get water and nutrients, right? Because seven to eight years old tree, can, the taproot system can do, go down to 2.5 meters. And of course, we'll also to select those having very thick bark, right? That gives you more latex vessels and more yield. And of course, also we go with acute branching and uh, angle branching and having uh, oval canopy. This is some of the characteristics, that characteristics of uh, uh, wind resistance. And we put it on, on paper. Uh, these are the all mainly the objectives, high latex yield, high timber yield, good growth figure, Resistance to major leaf diseases, resistance to wind damage, good curve increment, good bark thickness, tolerance to tree dryness, acceptable latex and rubber properties, response to chemical stimulation, good cedar, all right? This is for those ones to have extract oil from the seeds. And in the, for marginal areas, uh, then we go with this cold tolerance clone. So, even we are happy, the breeders happy, but still in the heart, we are not that really happy because of the narrowness of the HVR genetic base. It's a major obstacle uh, towards improving the rubber yield and other important characters. All right. So uh, the RDB in 1981 had gone to the Amazon all right, to collect this uh, HVR germplasm. And there are three states that the, uh, the collection in Acre, Rondonia, and Mata Grosso. Initially, when Henry Wickham collected the seeds, is from a small area here at Boim, or those at the confluence of the Tapajos and the Amazon River. All right? And uh, this is just to show you some of the very vigorous, big and, uh, uh, genotypes from the 1981. And then in 1995, the Malaysian government and the uh, uh, Brazilian had a joint expedition to the Amazon. Uh, this time, they, they we are focusing on these areas, those in the upper Amazonas, all right, those bordering uh, to uh, Peru and this Colombia, in the areas of Tabachinga, Benjamin Constant, Atalia do Norte, Sao Paulo, the Olivencia, all right. And uh, just to show you 
uh, before we move in for the expedition. Uh, these are the members. All right. Uh, this is Ato Aziz when he was a young man. Uh, that's me and my colleagues. And uh, the, the trees are being evaluated and also have been decided at the moment. And just the RDB, and we had Dr. Aziz uh, plan to have a new expedition to the Amazon. And this time it's Amazon Peru. All right. Uh, and this is the, those areas of our prospection. And the objective is to collect seeds of the various human species from the Amazon of Peru with the purpose of increasing the heavier genetic pool in the RDP member countries towards enhancing heavier genetic improvement. All right. And what's the justification of the, for the expedition? We feel further progress in heavier breeding for better yields for both latex and timber can be achieved through the widening of the narrow genetic base of this crop. And uh, this is important. There is evidence that genes for disease resistance and other desirable traits such as tolerance to low temperature may be found in heavier species in Peru. So our areas of prospection is this green areas. This on the eastern side of the Andes. All right. Uh, this is Amazon Peru. And we like to go to those areas, Equitos, Pucalpa, and right down to these areas of Tingo Maria for the prospection. And we hope to collect more, about six species uh, from this coming expedition. And what we're going to do with these materials, it can be for direct use for timber species, and also for the uh, hybridization with the uh, germplasm with the Wickham, Wickham with the germplasm crosses or the back crosses, and also the, the widening of the genetic base. And uh, my, this last slide is the RDB also having 49 clones, multilateral clone for exchange, which uh, is a way forward to meet the industry needs to for vigorous high yielding clones, which are resistant to diseases and suited for cultivation in varying climatic conditions, even in the marginal areas, including those one, all right, in the, I just mentioned, marginal areas. So thank you for listening to us. Heber breeding is a process, no ending and no beginning. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Othman. That was yeah. very insightful, no, no beginning, but, but progressing, of course. <laughs> Uh, and um, so let me let me ask uh, our, our last presenters from uh, uh, Indonesia, Dr. Vijaya, to to take the floor. And and then since we are uh, a bit late in the program, if we don't manage to to connect today, Dr. Omokaka from Nigeria, I propose that we we we, we manage to having tomorrow in our in our program because uh, we we believe that an African perspective is is, is also very important. Uh, but please, uh, Dr. Vijaya, please, uh, please take the floor. If you're here. Dr. Vijaya from the Indonesian Rubber Research Institute, do you copy? So we had him in the room a few minutes ago, so shouldn't shouldn't be far away. In the meantime, I, I what I could what I could uh, ask uh, or distinguish other uh, presenters or, or or panelists or 
uh, the, the person, the 167 person having joined us in the audience. Uh, if you have questions, please, I think we can use the time right now. Uh, either please use the chat and um, or the Q&A and, and then I, I can redirect the questions to, to the two presenters while we try to get the last one. So that there was there is one question, if I if I may, in the Q and A from Thierry Sayer, whether someone around the table does have an idea about the active avia breeding programs around the world today. So I guess that's perhaps a question for IRDB to brief us or brief the audience on that. So it's a Q and A on the on, on the chat. The technical persons, can you give the floor to IRDB, to Dr. I figure out the question because it's too small for my eyes. <laughs> what, <laughs> what are the active year breeding programs? Around yeah, the what, are, what about the, the, the current status of the EVA breeding programs around the world? How is it going? Okay, thank you very much. First, with the 1981 expedition, the materials have all been circulated, subject to the request of the uh, the receiving countries, they have and they have utilized uh, those uh, germ germplasm brought in 1981 and there are now clones produced because it takes about 30 years or so. And these clones, some of them are included in the RDB multilateral clone exchange program, which a uh, total of 49 clones are being exchanged. And included in these are five clones from bred in the Bahia CMS which is Sirat Michelin uh, selection clones from Bahia. So they are also included. And the, the next breeding program, the reason why we are keen to go to Peru is because some countries are growing rubber. So low, you know, low temperature areas and some also in drought prone areas. So we actually discussed this project with the late uh, Dr. Schultes, who is the, who was the ethnobotanist from Harvard University. And he, he told that he did some collection. So he's in Peru. So we are hoping to get the, in fact, we've been in touch with the Peruvian government. Only thing we haven't got the green light yet. We invited somebody from the Department of Agriculture to Philippines in 2014. I think that's the, the program is, very active breeding program in all the member countries. So now since Pat Thomas is already here. Thank you I very much. And I guess uh, that, that's very, that's, that's, that's a very uh, comprehensive answer. Of course, there are many much more to be said. I think that can be followed yes. up uh, offline or in the chat, but because in the mean, in the meanwhile, meantime, uh, Dr. Vijaya has managed to, to come back online. So, uh, I guess the thanks for joining back and the, the floor is yours for, for your presentation. So Dr. from the uh, Indonesian uh, Rubber uh, Research Institute. Please, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, the organizer. Sorry, my internet is getting trouble. So I have become offline for a few minutes. So I will start my presentation. Okay, everybody see my presentation? Hello? Yes, it's, go ahead, please, it's perfect. Okay, thank you. So I will start my presentation. My topic of presentation is climatic monitoring and analysis to optimize rubber cultivation. So we know that climate is very important. Rubber growth and yield is really affected by climate variability. And we know that El Nino, La Nina, and recently uh, Indian, Indian Ocean Development uh, affected the amount of rainfall, especially in Indonesia. We are 
really affected by this uh, anomaly, a uh, climatic anomaly. So this also affect the performance of rubber tree. So the importance of climate observation is uh, we need the data used for land suitability assessment and to know the how great the climate uh, fluctuation, the impact of climate fluctuation, and we can relate climate with the crop performance. And the most important thing is we can make adjustment in rubber cultivation. Now I will talk about more on adjustment on cultivation based on the climate data. So I'm presenting you the standard climate station. This picture in the Sembawa Research Center. Uh, this is a conventional climate station. Uh, we need a space of 20 meters by 20 meters. But now uh, the instrument like this, like the candle stop on the left, uh, right, is for solar radiation measurement, and this is for temperature and humidity measurement, uh, pan evaporation, and also for rainfall measurement. But now there is a new technology uh, called automatic weather station. Uh, this is more simple, only need a small space, and everything is recorded in this uh, kind of station. Automatic weather station uh, got the sensor on radiation, UV, temperature, humidity, wind speed, and wind direction and rainfall. Data is transmitted wireless and recorded by console. Climate condition can be seen on console screen. So what happened in the field, we can monitor from the room, from the monitoring of the console. And also we can record frequency of recording, for example, every five, 10, or 30 minutes. And also equipped with a software called WeatherLink, we can also calculate the evapotranspiration estimation. And also we can share the data to other station, so we can uh, develop the link between station. This is uh, a picture of the console that we can put in the room. We can monitor what happened in the field, the climatic condition, the weather condition in the room. So it is very comfortable. So the advantage is data is more easily uh, intensively recorded. Data is stored in file, uh, less human error, you know that by recording manually by human, sometimes we make error uh, reading incorrectly. And this, uh, with this data, we, we can reduce the error. Also reduce the limitation officer. For example, holiday and sickness and the officer cannot come to the office and we lost the data. But with uh, automatic weather station, this can be uh, ignored. And also there is a feature of weather forecasting, whether the next three hours will be rain or not, uh, this given by the, the software. And also less expensive compared to the conventional uh, with the station and more practical and movable. So I'm talking the climate data analysis and use. First is uh, we can predict rainfall, uh, especially during El Nino, La Nino, because we know that there is a strong correlation uh, SOI also atmospheric in index with rainfall and we could read uh, with three monthly ahead. This uh, uh, example there is uh, SOI and we know that when SOI is negative correspond to El Nino and rainfall will be less. So I study in uh, one plantation and we have uh, a linear correlation between rainfall and also with SOI so we can predict SOI with the rainfall. Also with the automatic weather station, we know the time of rainfall. This is the distribution rainfall in the Sembawa Research Center. We can study that most rain is uh, occur in the afternoon. Yeah, we can see the more frequent rain after two o'clock, two p.m. Yeah, so this means that we need to be careful on the late drip of latex. If we, the latex still dripping and the rain come, it will be lost. Yeah. And recently we developed a simple rain guard. Uh, we can apply the tapping panel and we can see that we can uh, reduce the latex loss by using the rain guard. We can see that tapping panel is still dry. Well, the 
above the rain gut, uh, we can see that uh, still wet. So this example of the effect of Lanina, so in uh, Zimbabwe Research Center, so we can see that more rain come during the Lanina. We can see the tapping D, yeah. Tapping D is increased, uh, 334 is on Lanina, on normal rate 328, so increase of uh, rainfall D, also reducing also the tapping D. So, we lost of the uh, rubber yield too of rain, excessive rain during the Lanina. So anticipation also leave disease attack. We know the characteristic of Colletotricum is uh, really related strongly with the climatic condition, especially rainfall. So the effect of uh, Colletotricum is very severe, usually the, during the Wintering and refueling. We can see that yield is uh, depressed uh, during the Lanina condition and slowly recover. But uh, we lost three month yields due to the uh, Lanina to the Polytotricum. And based on the experience, we can uh, make a early warning system. So Polytotricum is related to the first. 10 days of new leaf formation. What happened in the ten, first 10 days will uh, affect the leaf uh, performance. For example, if uh, the rainfall is less, for example, less than three days, so the leaf is okay. But going to six to eight days rain during the first 10 days, this uh, affect the leaf performance because collateral will attack severely. So based on the climatic observation, Actually, we can uh, make a decision to control the leaf uh, disease. And now we are working on the pestalotiopsis. So we need to gather more data and then we will do the same, uh, looking at the climatic criteria and related to the attack of the disease. So a uh, practical example of uh, using the climatic data is uh, for the water requirement. Uh, people use the pan evaporation, class A pan evaporation, to estimate the water requirement. So usually we take the general approach. Uh, there is no water stress when available water in the soil is more than 50%. So we can estimate the ETP by measuring the from the pan evaporation or using the Penman method. This example of the, using the pan evaporation to estimate the amount of uh, irrigation we need to apply to rubber nursery. For example, one week there is no rain and we monitor from pan evaporation and multiply by KC, KC is crop coefficient. So we know the number by experiment. So it's the estimation of water requirement, two, three, three, two and two and three millimeters. Total for one week is uh, Water requirement is 18 millimeters. And by knowing the characters of soil, we know that 50% of available water is 30 millimeters. So knowing, by knowing that we need to bring back soil moisture to fill capacity, how much? So we can also uh, simply calculate uh, 30 millimeters subtract with 18. So we need to apply irrigation as much as 22 millimeters. So it's mean a way to avoid the water stress for rubber industry. And then next one is time of planting also important. So we want to plant when there is no water deficit or when rainfall is greater than ETP or potential evapotranspiration and soil also moist enough. And because of the rainfall variability, we need to take account the probability. So normally people take 70% of probability occurrence. Will be better to anticipate the climatic anomaly. Here's an example uh, from the Sembawar Center. This is a long-term data, uh, 20 years data. Usually people think about the average or mean annual rainfall. We can see it's quite high and we can see that September usually is Hi, but actually if we take the variability of uh, rainfall, this is not good enough. This is uh, risky. 
Now we are applying the probability, 75%. Now by doing this one, we know that the safest month for planting is November because we have a good probability of success. The rainfall is 216 millimeters. Before that, October, September, August is very risky because uh, low rainfall based on the probability. So we need to take on the chance, yeah, chance of the success. This way the concept of the planting is depend on the variability of rainfall. Uh, so next one is crop model. It's needed for to know the potential of growth rubber tree, especially for new area that we haven't have experience growing rubber area and, and we use the rainfall radiation temperature to develop the model. So I adopt from Australian model, growth model, using three index, moisture, thermal, and light index. When growth index is zero, it means no growth. If growth index equal to one, it means that optimum for rubber growth. This example of moisture index, we can see that Ratio actual and potential evapotranspiration, evapotranspiration is will be optimum when soil at fill capacity. But it's going down when the water is running out, the ratio going down. So it means that if the EA over ETP getting lower, it means then water is become limiting. So water uh, plant will be stressed. And then also I developed from other many sources of experiment relation growth and the average air temperature. You can see that the optimum temperature is about 28 centigrade. It's good for rubber growth. And going down when the temperature is getting very low and become zero when it comes to 10 degrees. So we can use this for modeling. Yeah? This example, if I run the model for several places, Palembang is ideal for the rubber, but Selo Parang Selong is very dry area. You can see that growth is very slow and reaching the maturity after nine years. Also for high elevation like Gudung Mekang and Pajar Bulan, temperature is low, also the growth also slower and maturity maybe after eight years. So the climate is very important to, to be known especially if we want to grow in new area. In conclusion, climate data can be used for prediction and control of disease. Rainfall monitoring can assist in yield prediction and soil tapping management. Monitoring ETP can be used for education guidance. Also, climate data is very important for planting time decision. Also, the last one is for prediction growth in new planting area. Okay, this is all my presentation. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you, um, Dr. Vijaya. That was, uh, that was very interesting. So now we, we have 15 minutes uh, to close the session. Uh, there has been many uh, questions already asked in, uh, in, the, in the chat and, and, and thanks to, to Frederick for having already, I guess, answered uh, eight of, of them. Um, th Thank there you. is one question, um, there, are, there are the remaining question in the chat and I, and I asked the panelists to look, look at those. Uh, let, me, let me put one uh, in the spotlight. Uh, they're all interesting, but one I found int that I, I found quite uh, relevant to this discussion is, is the issue of uh, tra non-traditional areas and the need to look in those in those areas with with new data coming from existing research. So, but 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 why should we do that? This question from Jacob Matthew. When when currently uh, we know there is a perhaps a gap between excess uh, supply versus demand, uh, and uh, so the question is why should we promote more planting in non-traditional areas, particularly breeding for specific clones? for non-traditional uh, places. So does, does anyone want to, to, to reply to this question? Why is that important to look at that? Why breed in non-traditional? Uh, yes. Can you hear me clearly? Yes. Yeah, okay. Sure. The, the reason is this, because there are small holders 
who are who have land in the non-traditional areas and the best crop for them to grow is rubber because rubber upon maturity will give a steady income for the next 20 25 years well true under the current situation you are looking at a low price scenario we have seen low prices before and the the, the, the issue at hand is rubber normally bounces back uh, although the, the current price might not be looking attractive to the growers but we cannot but help the smallholders who are in these non-traditional areas that they want to grow rubber it's not that we are forcing them to grow rubber so we have to have clones which will help them to achieve certain productivity level and even in some countries it is already happening that the poor soils are relegated for rubber cultivation so you need also to when we say non-traditional areas sometimes the poor soils uh, and uh, you know the, the dry areas these are not the traditional areas for rubber so we need to do that we need to do the breeding but this does not mean we are not breeding for the other the common thing is additional to the current breeding program we need to have also clothes that can be suitable for planting in the non-traditional areas thank you thank you thank you dr aziz i see that some um, participants have their hand raised if you have your hand raised, uh, please uh, write your question in, in the chat and, 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 and we'll, we'll ask that to, to the panelists. Does anyone from the presenters have a question or comment on another presentation? You can, the presenters, they can take the, the floor. They can have this feature. Yeah. So if not, I have, in the meantime, I have a question. I hope you hear me. Uh, follow, follow, as a follow-up to what Dr. Aziz just said, what do you see the role of, of international cooperation for, for planting in these marginal conditions and, and this adaptation to, to, to non or less optimal conditions? What is, uh, is it a national problem or should it be kind of an international uh, issue? I think it is going to be an international issue because non-traditional areas is not just uh, in one country, it's in many, many countries. And the RDB is fortunate in the respect that we have all these different member institutes having problems like that. So we, uh, our, uh, our mission is basically is a cooperative mission to meet the needs of the small, the growers, which are predominantly now smallholders. So it is an international cooperation. Okay, Vincent? Yes, yes, I, I, I hear you. And, and how do you see the, the role of the international research versus the role of, of the, the governments, the, the states, and, and looking at this issue in the future? Yes, I think uh, I must point out that natural rubber is a very unique, you know, heavier species, very, very unique. The first, multilateral clone exchange program that we did was in 1974 and that gave an opportunity for some of these countries to put their clones for the trial conducted in different countries the outcome of it is rubber trees they do not uh, you know if it is bred in indonesia sometimes it doesn't grow that well in indonesia it grows well in uh, in malaysia a good example is rm600 we don't plant this clone anymore, but 67% or more of RIM 600 is planted in Thailand and the Brazilian in South America, they love RIM 600. So this is just an example. That's why the board, the RDB board has decided we should start this multilateral clone exchange so that the 49 clones can be exchanged and tested. The main reason is these clones need to be tested. So then you have an opportunity, whether it is for the high altitude or for the, uh, you know, for the cold region or for the dry regions, uh, basically not only the non-traditional areas. So government, I think here, when we talk about the government support, 99% of the RDB member institutes are government-owned institute. And I, I give you an example. 
why international cooperation in breeding is very important. You see, the oldest rubber research institute in the world is Ararai, Sri Lanka. So it was established in 1909. And when we had the problem of Carinospora, and the Sri Lankan plant breeders came up with a clone resistant to Carinospora. So I think that's just to give one example. Otherwise, I have to take one hour to explain you in details. Yes, thank you. That, that's very useful. And I think it's, I hope you hear me. I think that we can also discuss tomorrow uh, about these issues and, and make them uh, um, raise the awareness of, of all our stakeholders of this, uh, of the importance of international cooperation. Um, are there any other question yes. in, from the presenters? Someone wants to raise their hand. From the group. What is the effect of climate change on soil quality, soil acidity, available soil moisture content? Then I'm telling you, Dr. Frederick. Dr. Zalina, Dr. Thomas, Ramay, Dr. Thomas, me. Yeah, I was reading the question. So this is a, a good question that I did not address in my presentation, because actually uh, <laughs> we won't have much study on this, but of course, um, uh, soil uh, especially soil water content or soil moisture content is a very important driver of uh, the biological activity of the soil, which in turn is very important for the, the soil quality. So uh, we can expect that if we have more uh, extreme events of um, uh, dry period or very hot period, it can affect uh, the soil quality. But so far, uh, we haven't uh, studied it and uh, I haven't in mind any study about this in rubber plantation. But this is something that we must consider, of course. Thank you. Thank you, Farik. So I guess now it's... There are many questions, so I think uh, the, the, the answers can continue in the chat for those who want to provide a, uh, one perspective on, on the questions. Uh, that can go on offline. So I yeah. would like to thank all the presenters and, and we will um, uh, get in touch with Dr. Omo Kafe uh, from the Rubber Research Institute of Nigeria so that he can make his presentation uh, t tomorrow. Do you yeah, hear? I just want to, yeah, I just want to mention yeah, that I, 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 I have to leave you because it's very late for me. <laughs> it's 1 a.m. Uh, so thank you very much. And uh, sorry for those who uh, have uh, questions. I, I won't be able to answer, but uh, maybe you can forward to me or send it to my email. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Frederic. So uh, to... To wrap up, um, I, I think we, we see that there are many uh, elements that come from research, that come from the current uh, size, the current places of operation that can be relevant for the crucial questions of, of, of the future of rubber, including where uh, perhaps new plantations can be, can be established given the climatic condition in 30 years from now, which is the key question. And, and, and understanding what are these conditions will be key for uh, to renew plantations, the question of what kind of genetic material, we've seen that, the question of management practices, uh, uh, the, good, the good management practices, and uh, because uh, of these renewal questions, it's important to be able to give to smallholders and, and, and to investors the appropriate information and the technical package and incentives, and I think we've seen from, there, there would be many other examples, I guess, but from the set of presentation that, that there is already knowledge available uh, uh, from that uh, to answer these questions. And, and another important point is how do we get climate and climate change information uh, to do these projections to orient uh, the plantations. So we've seen uh, examples also in, in, in other crops, uh, like coffee, for example, uh, where uh, vulnerability or suitability studies are critically important. Uh, and, and then there is the question of, in new areas, how do you uh, ex have ex uh, extension services? How do you help farmers? How do you help smallholders? And then the value chains. 
uh, we have also good examples uh, to, to present. So uh, as a wrap up, I think that the question of uh, this future uh, distribution of rubber, which is both within the new areas and, uh, and the traditional ones, which both are going to be, to be disrupted, will need to take into account a lot of different things, as we've seen in these presentations. Uh, the complementarity with other land uses, including the potential to integrate with other crops for the agriculture, uh, the look, looking at how it relates to the protection of primary forests, the, com the competition with palm oil, and the role for rubber for, for local communities and the adaptation to climate change. I guess we've, we've heard also some opportunities in terms of improving soil, soil quality, uh, if good management practices are, are, are done, uh, and uh, the, the issue about looking also at carbon content uh, given land use change, but also the opportunities in wood uh, uh, and, and, and as part of uh, the wood material. And we'll be able to talk about that as well uh, tomorrow because rubber, it's not only uh, the, 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 the natural rubber as a, as a bioproduct, but it's also, it's also of course, the, the wood. Uh, so uh, I would like to thank uh, all of you for, for this session and uh, I w it's now time for a short break uh, of 10 minutes until uh, 20 until uh, uh, yes let me give the Singapore time so that we are online until uh, 3.25 p.m. Uh, Singapore time so please uh, either you can keep uh, uh, being online, uh, talk on the chat, uh, there will be a slide and some music during the pause and let's come back uh, in 10 minutes for the session that uh, Eric Gohe from CIRAD will, uh, will chair and that will look at the mitigation aspects but also the adaptation aspects of, of rubber to climate change. Thank you very much.